President, good afternoon everyone. I'm Rina Agarwal, Vice Provost for Faculty at Georgetown University and Director of the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy. Welcome to our Georgetown Global Virtual FinTech Seminar Series. Um, I hope everyone is making it all right to the end of the semester. We are almost there. And now the planning is all in full swing for the fall semester with the lots of uncertainties. Our center, the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy, we provide thought leadership for global finance. We believe in excellence in research to impact practice and policy. In addition to doing these virtual seminars, we are also doing other events. So earlier this week, uh, we hosted an event on the markets have been dropped. Where are they headed? It was a very interesting discussion. We had uh, Guy Adami from uh, CNBC's Fast Money. We had Kathy Murphy, Fidelity's uh, personal investing. She's the president of Fidelity's personal investing. We have an upcoming event on ETFs. So these are more industry oriented and these recordings are available on our website if you want to check them out. So I do invite you to visit our website and uh, also follow our Twitter handle at GU Fin Policy. I want to thank our team, John Jacobs, our executive director, Alberto Rossi. Alberto has been running our seminar series on FinTech and is the associate director of the center and Anna Cormus, the assistant director of the center. We are grateful to our partners. This seminar series is brought uh, and made possible by Ripple. We are part of Ripple's University Blockchain Research Initiative. And today, we are absolutely delighted to have Professor David Yermak as a presenter. David is the Albert Fingerhood Professor of Finance and Business Transformation. David, that's the first time I've seen that in anyone's title. David is also the chair of the finance department at New York University Stern School. So I just want to point out to everyone, please feel free to raise your hand whenever you have a question. We are, we are going to try to take questions as the seminar goes along and not just wait till the end. You can also submit your questions via the chat feature. That's fine too. And uh, Alberto Rossi will manage the questions. Uh, also, do make sure you're muted during the event. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to David. David, I don't think we can hear you. Uh, some problem with the audio now here. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. No, we okay. Can. Not sure what went wrong when I shared <laughs> the screen, but um, okay. So I, I was invited about six weeks ago to um, speak on a FinTech topic, and I, I proposed to simply track what happened during the crisis, it was very obvious, you know, as much as two months ago that there would be real dislocations to the financial system. And I don't have a paper yet, although I might at some point, but I want to talk about a number of developments that have been occurring pretty much in real time. And I want to start with this graph that simply shows a crazy rally that has been taking place. If you had bought Bitcoin at the local minimum on March 12th, you would have earned a rate of return through the end of April of about 74%. I mean, this is just um, you know, a wild run up in much of it in the last 10 days, in fact. The other markets have also done very well. You know, despite an unprecedented economic meltdown around the world, you see gold up 8%, the equity market in the US is up by 17%. No one can make much sense of any of this. But the real show has been in the crypto markets. And it's not just Bitcoin. In fact, many of the other crypto assets have done much better. Um, the Ether token with Ethereum has more than doubled, for instance. And Ripple, Litecoin, you, 
you can pick your token, but anyone invested in crypto for the last six weeks or so has done extraordinarily well. I think there are three background themes that one should think about closely, and I want to talk about each of these. I've written on some of these issues in the past and probably will again in the future. Um, I would just put out there that for purposes of this talk, um, anything I say, people should just treat as fair game for their own research, um, especially younger faculty, doctoral students who may be on the call. There's, there's an awful lot to follow up on, given what's currently going on. And um, I want to put some ideas out there. I would never have enough time to follow up myself on all these things. But the three big themes I want to look at, um, one is really a foundational idea in the valuation of crypto which is whether crypto assets represent a, a type of digital gold, a permanent asset that is not manipulated by central banks and becomes essentially a refuge in troubled times. And if there's ever a time where this theory should become relevant, of course, it would be right now where the world economy is crashing and central banks are engaging in unprecedented flooding of money into the system. It, it's the nightmare of everybody who misses the gold standard. And this, by all rights, should be the time for crypto to shine. And that certainly is happening. A second issue, which this really took me by surprise, but I think it's probably the most important of the three. There's been some debate about the Federal Reserve in the US launching a digital currency of its own. It's been loosely called the digital dollar. Um, I'll talk about who is lining up behind this. And it's a surprising amount of influential people but I think um, there's a lot of opportunity here and it would involve very significant changes, including the disintermediation of the banking system and that citizens could have digital wallets directly at the Federal Reserve. And um, the need to deliver assistant payments to many people who don't have bank accounts in the US is what has, has prompted the recent interest in this. But the reality is that this is a very important idea that other countries have already taken fairly far down the road and the crisis may be providing an opportunity for the U.S. to, to make up for lost time and to reconsider the, the role in the form of currency in, in our own economy. Finally, um, many of you probably know that in about 11 days, the mining return for Bitcoin will be cut in half, which by design occurs every four years approximately. This is, many people call this the halvening. I would simply call it the halving but there's intense interest in this. And many people attribute the run up in Bitcoin's price to the fact that the mining reward is going to be cut sometime around May 12th. I think most of these explanations are pure nonsense. Um, some of them have a self-fulfilling behavioral quality to them, but there's no denying that there's a lot of buzz in the market about this. And in particular, the two times that this has happened before, were at the doorstep of what turned out to be huge bull markets in crypto. And so there are people who I think are buying just on the basis of FOMO, thinking that this event is much more important than it probably is. So I hope that we can spend about 10 minutes on each of these. And as Rena said, do, do feel free to interrupt as we go along. But I want to talk and give some background about each of these. So let's begin with the um, eminent dean of valuation. This is my colleague, Aswath de Modern, of course. Um, Aswath comments all the time in the media about valuations of different assets. And about three years ago, I think this is one of his most viewed and downloaded interviews, um, he spoke about whether digital currency is the new gold. And um, to be clear, he doesn't necessarily believe this himself, but the point of the interview is that he has identified many other people, especially millennials, as thinking that cryptocurrency is the new gold. And he says he doesn't know how to value crypto and he doesn't know how to value gold either, but it seems that a substitution may be underway where the digital scarcity of the crypto asset really stands in for the, digit, for the physical scarcity of gold as a commodity that the world has valued in one way or another for thousands of years. And the people who created Bitcoin, and we're going back now 11 years in history, but when this was launched in 2009, it was clearly inspired by a nostalgia for the gold standard and a lot of regret and lamentation about the lack of discipline in central banks. So 
Satoshi Nakamoto, very much a libertarian who had a lot of writings about the era of free banking and commentary that was posted around the launch of Bitcoin. And in particular, the monetary creation rate, I, I would assume most people on the, on the call today are very familiar with this, but there's a limit of 21 million Bitcoin that will be gradually issued over the course of 121 years. So by the year 2140, you will have a fixed supply and it is a decreasing rate or a concave growth rate so that every four years, the rate of growth is cut by 50%. So at first, the miners who successfully mined blocks got 50 Bitcoin. And then in 2012, this reward was cut to 25. It was then cut in 2016 to 12 and a half. And it's about to be cut again. If you look at this and think, if you were designing a monetary rule, would this be the rule? I've always thought that this looks like a stupid rule. It's a rule that will be over time deflationary. Um, it doesn't account for things like the fact that certain coins are lost or forgotten, but, but this is the rule and it's a very transparent rule. And that's perhaps as its, its greatest benefit is that there's complete commitment by the software to, to issue money on this basis. And if you look at the quote on the left, there's lots of quotes like this you can scrape off of the web where people claim a clear connection between the monetary growth of Bitcoin and the growth of gold. So in this case, somebody says on Wikipedia that the decreasing supply algorithm, that is the, the concave shape of the function, was chosen because it approximates the rate at which commodities like gold are mined. So the idea being that when gold is discovered, you can find it easily. And then as it's scarcer, there's diminishing returns to the activity of mining and so forth. Um, I got curious and I decided to look at whether this was really true. We have a lot of data about the production of gold going back to ancient times. And if we look over the course of about 4,000 years of mining history, gold is not concave at all. In fact, it's been extremely convex in the production function as people have improved the technology at a very rapid rate. I think the same is true of petroleum and many other commodities. So this is one of many cases where the people who are evangelists for crypto really have no idea what they're talking about. I mean, the basic thesis that this concave growth of, um, of crypto resembles gold just isn't borne out by history. But nevertheless, there's a belief that, you know, in times like this where central banks seem to be losing all caution, that you need to run for safety to gold or to crypto. And what you're looking at here is the rate of return from not the local minimum on March 12th, but beginning at the start of the year. So what if you had taken a dollar on New Year's Eve on December 31st, there's no pandemic yet, and you could have, I'm giving you five choices here, either Bitcoin, gold, the S&P index, the exchange traded long-term treasury fund that you could get from Vanguard. And I put oil on here just for, for laughs. And um, you can see that even from the start of the year, there was a huge rally in crypto that was well underway. And by February, you begin to see the meltdown of the equity markets, you know, well before there was any kind of national emergency. Throughout the month of February, this is more severe in the energy markets. And if you look at things like airline stocks and cruise ship stocks and so forth, it seemed that Wall Street was um, clued into the risk of a pandemic, you know, weeks ahead of any governments. And crypto and gold were really doing quite well through most of this period. Now, to understand what happens here, we need to look closely at one date in particular, which is March 12th. And on March 12th, Bitcoin lost something like 40% of its value in one day. And if we look at other assets, none of them did well either. In fact, the equity markets in gray drop about 10%, gold drops, even treasuries drop, oil of course is down. But the drop in Bitcoin is incredibly severe. And what I think is even more interesting is that as Bitcoin was being sold off, people are going into Tether, which is the stable coin that is meant to hold its value right around $1 per Tether. And for reasons that are hard to understand, Tether is usually extremely successful. It rarely trades at less than 99 or more than $1.01. 
But on this one day, there was such demand for Tether that it spiked up as high as $1.08, which is just extremely rare for a stable coin, and then settled at $1.04 and eventually got back to a dollar the next day. But you see a clear liquidity event in the crypto markets. And what I've come to believe is that there's something going on here that is really independent of the financial meltdown that's occurring generally around the world. And we need to understand what happened on March 12th to make more sense of what's going on in the crypto markets generally. So you can see all sorry, kinds David, of indicators. Just, sorry, sorry. Interruption. Yeah. So what happened to Ethereum, for example? On that it day, good? it was not as severe. And this is, okay. in fact, what I want to talk about. Um, we have data from the Bitcoin. This is the size of the waiting queue in the mempool, and it spikes up just on that one day. The voluntary fees to the miners to get to the head of the queue. You know, all the indicators that you would expect. But here's you know, really the interesting thing, these are the inflows of Bitcoin to crypto exchanges. So these are people who held Bitcoin in private wallets and then listed them on various exchanges around the world, essentially to prepare to dump them in a major unloading on one day. And so what this is really reduced to is a forensic exercise to figure out who was so, what, what whale really wanted to get out of Bitcoin so badly that they were pumping them onto exchanges and then unloading them and taking Tether at an 8% discount in exchange for them. I mean, these are people who really wanted to sell very badly. So I've asked my friend Amin Shams, who is the um, Tether detective at Ohio State, if he knows what's going on. Amin, at, at least to my knowledge, has not unearthed the mystery here, but there's kind of two theories bubbling around. One is that this was actually a Chinese Ponzi scheme where most of the people got sent to jail, but they had kind of walled off the Bitcoins, ring fenced them, and they decided just by chance to unload them all in a massive dump on March 12th. So this is essentially the exodus of Chinese organized crime from a scam that had been um, caught up with by the authorities. The other hypothesis is that this was market manipulation by miners. And this feeds into the idea of the Bitcoin having that they, de they wanted to push the price down to make mining very uneconomical now and scare people out of the mining market so that they would increase their own market share. I think these are both very interesting hypotheses and they're interesting not just for March 12th, but just more generally. You know, do miners manipulate the price of Bitcoin? How do miners liquidate the new Bitcoins that they get? We really haven't seen a lot of research on this, but March 12th seems to have been an especially dramatic event that um, would, would bear some you know, really granular analysis of blockchain and behavior on exchanges and so forth. You just don't see this kind of action where Tether spikes up so dramatically as high as $1.08. But if you can look beyond that one 40% hit, you know, Bitcoin is up 22% since then. And even with, even with having gone underwater, it's up 20% for year to date. And I think this is just remarkable. So, we have more to learn about this one event on March 12th, um, but you've seen a, a really puzzling rearrangement of risk in most of the asset markets. Um, I've simply graphed here the volatility of Bitcoin before and after this date on March 12th. And it's not unusual for crypto to have volatility. This is on an annual basis of about 100%, and it has dropped a little bit since then. But look at the volatility of all the other markets. and um, Stocks, S&P 500 volatility has been really, really high. Oil is absolutely off the charts and you can't even calculate oil because there was that one day it went negative. And so I've deleted that from my calculation. But Bitcoin really doesn't look so risky anymore. It's just you know, a little bit more than stocks and the risk rather than going up has actually come down. So I don't wanna push too hard on this digital gold hypothesis, but I think um, this, this is kind of the moment that people will look back on, like what happened in the pandemic? Clearly there's a rush to crypto. Crypto looks safer than it usually does, even as other things look riskier. And I think you're going to see a revival of discussions. And to me, the interesting issue here is exactly what is the research question? How, how to frame this? Is this really only in weak countries with 
you know, the worst central banks or is this um, wealthy people trying to go off the grid and get out of the financial markets? I think understanding the demand that's driving this remains, you know, almost completely unresearched, but is probably the basis of a lot of opportunity going forward. So let me move ahead and talk about the digital dollar. And when the first round of legislation came out, which was um, right around March 12th, I forget the exact date, um, I was really shocked by the fact that a bill introduced in the House of Representatives included basically a command for the Federal Reserve to create a digital dollar and make it available to people. Essentially, the audience for this was supposed to be people without bank accounts. And I think many of you know, this is an idea that's been kicking around for five or six years. There used to be a group at the Bank of England called the Future of Money Team that worked out a lot of the details about how this might be done. But the key to it is that you would have digital wallets held by individual people at the central bank, you know, that we could all bank at the Federal Reserve. And I don't know about you guys, but I bank at Bank of America, and this is a bank that fails all the time when there are crises in the financial system. And, you know, it's repeatedly bailed out by the government. And frankly, I'd rather bank at the central bank, which cannot be run. And I think given the choice, many people would feel this way, but there are of course many complications. You know, and how would the banks recapitalize themselves? Would they continue to make loans to businesses and for mortgages? You know, all that needs to be thought through. But this got so far that it was actually introduced in legislation in the US Congress. Now, ultimately this was stripped out and it wasn't passed, but just this week, and this is I think two days ago, there's a petition from 11 members of Congress to revive this idea. And you know, it says they're calling on the US Treasury to look at blockchains and distributed ledgers as a way to deliver assistance to people. And some of you may have seen on Wednesday that Gary Cohn wrote an op-ed in the Financial Times. This of course was um, the former president of Goldman Sachs and the head of Trump's National Economic Council for the first year of the administration. This is now a serious idea when you see, you know, multiple members of Congress and, you know, people from the heights of Wall Street and government lining up behind it. And I think this is actually really quite interesting. And even without the financial crisis, we would be having this conversation sooner or later. So the impetus for this is what I think is the well-known fact that there's just a lot of people in the U.S. who are excluded from the financial system. Um, the number of unbanked people in the U.S. is somewhere between 20 and 30 million, depending on exactly how you count them. And as you go around the world, especially to developing economies, there is probably about 3 billion people who don't get access to regular financial services simply because they can't get bank accounts. Sometimes it's simply because banks don't serve the market because they live in remote areas and so forth. So the idea that digital currency could become an alternative has been around really for as long as we've had crypto. And the idea that we may wanna directly involve government in this is an idea that's been around for five or six years. Um, this is data from the FDIC. I think it's interesting to look at where the unbanked tend to live. And this is as much a cultural thing as it is an economic problem. Um, this is FDI survey data where they simply ask people, why don't you have a bank account? And the number one reason is basically low income and poverty and so forth. But there's a certain clientele of people who simply don't trust banks. So that's the second most popular reason. Like, I'm not going to put my money in a bank. I don't trust banks. And reason number five is that people find it inconvenient to use banks, which I find quite striking. I mean, I would find it inconvenient not to have a bank, but there's at least one person in 20 out there who feels you know, the other way around and privacy concerns and so forth. So I think cryptocurrency can, can potentially meet these needs. And if the government issues crypto, it may really do two things. It would legitimize the asset class itself and maybe lead to a certain easing of a lot of the regulatory scrutiny that crypto has been under the last couple of years. So indirectly, there may be benefits to Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ether, and so forth. But I think there's also in the long run, the potential to integrate crypto into a national blockchain that might be run by the central bank. That this is really the, um, the dream or the fantasy of a lot of the crypto evangelists. And 
Now, this idea is now getting a, um, a, a new hearing, basically, in the corridors of power. It turns out that people without bank accounts, most of them have cell phones, and this is five years ago. So, you know, it's for many people much more necessary to have a smartphone than a bank account. And there's a whole market of unbanked people. I've got an event in the lower right where PayPal very explicitly has identified this as a target group where they feel they can make money by essentially offering financial services on a peer-to-peer -peer basis um, that bypass the traditional banking system, or at least give the appearance of doing that. So I think you're going to see, in, in fact, you're already seeing a reconsideration of whether we should be moving much faster to purely digital currency and whether there's a role in disintermediating the banks and that would at least indirectly benefit crypto that would underlie all of this. Now, I want to spend just a moment ticking the boxes about why we would want to do this. And the reason I've talked about up to now is the problem of financial inclusion. And I think this is a very persistent issue. There are real political divisions about issues like payday loans and so forth that makes this something of a third rail. But if you're willing to set that aside for a moment, there's lots of other interesting problems that would be addressed by some type of a FedCoin structure, as it's often called. I think probably the most urgent, and this is very relevant to the crisis, is that with electronic money, you can pay negative oh, interest David, rates. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting. I have a question from uh, Rich Lyons. Yeah, and go he's ahead. Asking, isn't, the, yeah, isn't the reason the digital dollar is moving slowly is that it would weaken banks and the Fed wants strong banks, other things being equal? Yeah, this is a very interesting question because it is very obvious that banks would be a victim of this. And... If banks were weakened, would we simply feel sorry for bankers and, and want to support that industry the way that we're supporting, you know, the construction industry or the food industry? Or is there something strategic about banks? Now, banks create credit, but they do it with mismatched maturities. They fund themselves with demand deposits and then lend long, and this leads to bank runs and bailouts and all the problems we're familiar with. And I think what would happen is that banks would have to recapitalize themselves and they would have to issue long-term debt, much more equity. Um, you would have what is often called a narrowing of the banking system. And this has been discussed um, to a greater or lesser extent since the 1930s, since the Great Depression. So I tend to have some sympathy for these ideas and I think it would solve long-standing thousand-year-old problems in the banking system but I think above all, this is something that we need to put on the academic agenda, that there's room for a lot of interesting policy discussion. And I think one of the nice side effects of this crisis is that this whole discussion seems to be getting a kickstart from, from the fact that this is actually being proposed in federal legislation. But I think it's going to be a journey. And the, the point I'm going to make in a moment is that China is already well down the road on this journey. And so we can't sit around and in seminar drawing rooms talking about this until the end of time, because there, there's now some, some urgency to it based on the behavior of other countries. So do you want to go for more questions? Because I see about eight of them in the chat now. But Yes, yeah, so that we had a kind of, a, a, I think that uh, Laura Gonzalez is basically saying, Go, Gonzalez uh, Alana, she's saying that uh, apparently up among the legal scholars, the, the consensus seems to be that the uh, um, the, the course of action would be to have that fintech innovations are merged into traditional banking right. because they can deal better with liabilities. Yeah, there's um, a proposal in the UK that you would repurpose the branch banks to essentially mm -hmm. be service bureaus for the central banks. Um, another flavor of this is that there are many payments companies that have been founded in the last 10 years who could probably do a better job and they might become subcontractors or compete for slices of the market in the same way that insurance companies compete for slices of the Affordable Care Act marketplace. I think there are, there are many variations to them, to this, and it, it's a very interesting issue about, you know, essentially the question reduces to, do we really need banks? And th it, it's rather surprising to be asking this question, but I think really this is consumer driven that that cash in the form that we know it is rapidly disappearing and this is to me you know extremely interesting and probably the most significant issue of, in the financial system today i've 
I've not easily gotten all my colleagues interested in this, but I'm happy that people are now putting <laughs> bills in the bin in Congress because it forces everyone to, to visit this issue much more closely. So I think that we have a question from Engine who's saying that WHO announced Corona as pandemic on March 12th. Is that a coincidence you think or not? It, it's a good question because I know there were events in Washington that day as well. And on the day it was announced, everybody already knew. In fact, I think people knew back in January, you know, you can see it in the equity markets and whether whether anything coming out of the WHO has any significance in moving the market, I'm deeply skeptical. Um, you know, I, I'm not like Trump in thinking these people are crooks, but I think that they've been well behind this and are simply ratifying information that other people already had. Right. Yeah, and I think, yeah, the rest of the kind of question or comments were, I think everybody wants your slides, <laughs> David. So you may, okay, so let me, send it let to me us, go we'll put back. it on the website. <laughs> we, um, yeah, the, the slides are going to be available. Um, I, I just want to make the observation that I think people are extremely familiar with that negative interest rates are a big issue now that banks would like to be paying them. Central banks would like to be paying negative interest rates. You're looking at the last financial crisis where essentially there was a floor of zero on the federal funds rate because when you pay negative interest rates, people can hold physical cash. And to the extent that you see negative interest rates in the world today, um, typically they are less than, they're within minus 1%, which is kind of the convenience cost of obtaining and holding cash. But I think today, given the choice, central banks would probably be paying minus three, minus 5%. And this would be much easier if all the money were electronic, which is a great reason to um, you know, essentially have the Federal Reserve issuing digital currency. I wanna give so a shout did, out to a, yeah, go ahead. Let me interrupt you. So we have a Nuno Fernandez who would like to ask a question. Let me yeah. just unmute you, Nuno. Go ahead, you can, can talk. You, can you hear me? Yes. Roberto? Yes. Thank you, David. Thank you. Great, uh, great presentation so far. I have, uh, I'm trying to understand a bit what you're saying here because, I mean, you've shown how Bitcoin is basically a speculative asset with good returns, perhaps counter-cyclical, a bit like gold is traditionally thought of, negative correlation with other assets. Uh, but you've shown as well that it's a high volatile asset. Okay? The volatility is much higher than other assets, in not, even in normal times. Uh, then you talk about the unbanked, right, and why they don't have bank accounts. But, I mean, those unbanked, they do have cash, right, and cash is always available. It's an alternative asset with zero volatility. So I would like to see, to know what is the relationship of the Bitcoin unbanked and the relationship with the Fed coin that you talk now. I'm trying to understand the, the, the relationship. Yeah, no, I, th I think I spoke to that earlier, but let me repeat that, you know, there seems to be um, both – a belief that you would get a much more benign regulatory regime in the future, that um, this would essentially confer a legitimacy on digital assets that they've never had before and make agencies like the Securities and Exchange Commission, the IRS, regulate them in a much less heavy handed way. You know, the IRS treats cryptocurrency right now the way it treats equity securities and it levies capital gains taxes on every transaction. And this is a great deterrence to its use. But if the Federal Reserve used the same technology to put a very similar asset out there, there's a belief that you wouldn't have the same tax problems. And so I think this accounts for some of the favorable market reaction. And then there's the potential that a wallet that was opened at the Federal Reserve could accept cryptocurrency alongside the government currency. And a belief that this might just drive secular demand. These are hypotheses. And I'm you know really repeating what I've read and heard from other people, you're free to reject them out of hand. But what I'm telling you is that there's an, an audience for this and a critical mass of people who are investing in crypto because they think these ideas are correct. And mm. yeah, so, we have another question from Jim yeah, Angel. Uh, great presentation. Another Thank argument you. for FedCoin is that the US has to do it to retain the preeminent role of the US dollar. If we don't have a currency in digital form, somebody else will. And we've definitely seen that these digital currencies are useful in a variety of applications, especially in places like the Internet of Things. So what do you think of uh, that argument for a Fed coin? I, I think this is completely correct. And you're just two slides ahead of me. Um, the People's Bank of China 
is very, very far down the road. And you know, maybe as soon as this year, we'll be putting its own digital currency into circulation. There is also a very aggressive experiment going on in Sweden with the e-kroner. And it, it's funny that as recently as two or three years ago, this idea was being ridiculed by most of the central banks. They are all working on it now. And I think there's no question what the reason for this is. It's the social media companies. And in particular in China, there's been incredible penetration into the payments business by WeChat and Alipay to the point that it has really taken a lot of the fee income out of the banking system and making, it, it's made what's, what's already a very shaky and risky banking system in China much less healthy than it was before. So I think China is doing this really to rein in the power of the social media companies. And this is also part of a global ambition for them to challenge the US dollar. I think, you know, since they've launched this program, China now has a very full plate. I mean, the whole government's legitimacy has been called into question by its handling of the pandemic, but there's no doubting their ambition. And I think um, simply to, to make sure the Chinese don't get a lead that is insurmountable in this area, the Federal Reserve needs to look at this very, very seriously. I, I wanna point out that the Chinese media companies, you see them everywhere. Um, I was in Europe last summer doing some visiting professor teaching and the German finance minister said that the only legal means of payment in the Euro area is the Euro. And the same day I went into Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam and there's a giant display saying WeChat Pay, smart flagship airport. So this is legal to use in Amsterdam, which the last I looked is in the EU. And here's a picture I took Christmas shopping at Saks Fifth Avenue in December. You know, this is right in the heart of capitalism in New York. You can pay with WeChat and Alipay at Saks. And, you know, there is a lot of ambition from the Chinese media companies, which is now being matched by their central bank. If the Federal Reserve doesn't get off the dime, as it were, and, and deal with this, um, the costs in the long run could be very, very high to the United States. And I think we've now seen people recognize this. And, you know, again, I'll, I'll say this is a very interesting problem. Let me, let me quickly make a couple more points and then move on to my third idea. I want to give a shout out to this um, really interesting doctoral dissertation, which I think came out of Oxford or maybe it was Cambridge this year, where the author found sovereign lending documents going back, well, seven centuries and looked at a secular decline in interest rates that in recent years has basically hit zero. And the argument implicitly is that negative interest rates are really here to stay, that this is not because of financial emergencies, but really because of long-term improvements in the efficiency and technology of the credit markets. And more to the point, you're seeing a shrinkage of world population. You're seeing very different supply of retirement savings. People are having less kids. There's less overpopulation. They're saving more so that the return on savings is going to drop. Um, Ken Rogoff and many other eminent people have written on this. And the need to pay negative interest rates, I think, is not going to be for crises. I think this is going to be business as usual for the next 50 or 100 years. And the only way that central banks can do this is if the money is purely electronic. Um, you can have much more efficient monetary policy. You're no longer pushing on a string. You can you know, give tax cuts directly to people with fiscal policy and you can target them to groups like students or elderly people. And as pointed out by the Bank of England, if everyone banks at the central bank, you can fund the national debt using people's demand deposits that are now sitting in the capital structures of these central banks or of the commercial banks. So this would be a few trillion worth of free capital to the government. And in the case of the UK, they estimate that this would save 3% of GDP in the net interest expense that was being paid a few years ago. So I think this is a very interesting menu of reasons. And the fact that the crisis has you know, gotten so many people to begin to fixate on a very important idea, I think is really something that we'll look back on as perhaps a turning point but also something that is indirectly benefiting Bitcoin, Litecoin, Tether, and, and all the other cryptos. Let me finally talk about the third thing on my list, which is the halving of the Bitcoin reward. 
this picture is very similar to the one that I had a few minutes ago, where it shows in blue the cumulative growth of Bitcoin, which is going to plateau at 21 million eventually. And then in orange is actually the year to year inflation rate. And approximately every four years, it's actually calibrated not by time, but by a certain count in the blockchain. But every, every four years roughly, and this should happen on or about May 12th, the mining reward gets cut in half, which is to say that the rate of creation of new Bitcoin falls by 50%. Now in the run up to this, you've really seen two very interesting things. One is that there are companies who market mining hardware, and the biggest of these firms is Bitmain in China, but there's a number of them, and the, the technology continues to improve very, very quickly. But they're using this as a marketing event. And in fact, in my crypto course in the fall semester, one of my final exam questions was to read the marketing pitches and try to give a rational explanation for why a customer should respond to these. And the right answer to that question is that there's no rational explanation, that if, if I'm a miner and my income is suddenly going to be cut by 50%, I want to make less capital investment. But the, these people are so giving David, sorry. guarantees. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry for interrupting. So we have a question from Luis Gagnon asking, yeah. is this uh, Fed court innovation paving the way to mass expropriation by the government? Yeah, I've heard this. Somebody called it a new way to um, raise taxes and so forth. Um, it is framed as exactly the opposite, although there are people who think that the payment of negative interest rates is a form of taxation. Um, we'll have to see how it's managed, but I think competition in the marketplace would keep the central bank from being able to use it as a hidden tax. You know, and I, th I think one could make a similar argument now, you know, if you really believe this were true about the interest we pay on the national debt and so forth. But I, I, I've not taken that one terribly seriously. So let me, let me talk through the rest of the halving. I think um, there is really some desperation by the mining industry to um, keep demand from dropping in a very severe way on, on or about May 12th. And frankly, since people knew this was coming, they probably have been cutting back their purchases of capital equipment well before this. And I think indirectly, this is potentially very bad for crypto that if the return to mining disappears, you'll have less mining, less security, less liquidity in the markets. And um, I don't think that the market has really internalized this. At the price of Bitcoin, if anything, should probably be falling rather than rising because of the um, so-called halving. But the dynamics of how the mining industry is trying to exploit this, I think is very interesting there are all kinds of promises being made to customers. There's even new firms entering the industry. And I haven't seen a lot of academic research on the interaction between the hardware and the code in this industry, which I think is a great topic with a lot of interesting data for people who have the energy and the resourcefulness to collect it. Now, I would also say that there's a huge behavioral component to this, that um, we've had two of these halvings before. The first was back in 2012, right here and then again in 2016. And I think as everybody knows, there were incredible bull markets within the next six months or so, 2013 and then 2017, were when Bitcoin first hit 1,000 and then ultimately 20,000. And so people say, you know, well, it's happening again. This is the third time and you always get a huge spike after the halving and so get in now. Um, I don't think this makes any sense at all, although I think many hypotheses in behavioral finance are similarly irrational, but if people expect other people to expect the price to go up, it, it may become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I think you know, if you wanna use behavioral models to price crypto, this is um, a very interesting event. And you have other coins that are derivatives of Bitcoin also undergoing halvings on not exactly the same day. So things like Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Gold, I think even Litecoin recently had a halving. And so the staggered occurrence of these at reasonably similar points in time gives you a nice possibility for an identification strategy if you really wanted to study the significance of this on both mining capacity and consumer demand. But in the end, to me, this looks like the Y2K problem. And I may be showing my age, but those of you who were around 20 years ago, and I know that's less and less of my colleagues every year, but there was a great fear that in the year 2000, 
so many computers had simply two digit fields for memory that the year would go from 99 to 00 and people would think it was 100 years ago and the you know all the financial markets would stop in their tracks when y2k actually happened it was a non event because everyone knew about it and prepared it should be the ha- the, the, the same with this having that you know everyone has known not only about this one but here's here's your map of all the ones that are coming four years. There'll be another one in 2024 and so forth. And this just shouldn't really be significant for the valuation. But on the other hand, if you go on, you know, Coindesk or all the other crypto news services, it's hard to escape the frenzy and, you know, it's just an incredible amount of publicity and attention, a countdown clock on Coindesk and so forth focused around this event. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens, although, Really, it, it should be nothing. So, so let I have me another stop question there for you. I'll yeah. take questions now for the balance of exactly. this. Time. Perfect. So, I, I have first question is from uh, Jim Angel. What is your favorite model for estimating the value of Bitcoin, <laughs> if you have one? Yeah, I've been asked this question so many times, and I, I don't <laughs> have one at all. I, I've never understood the value of Bitcoin, and I've always <laughs> cautioned my students you know, to stay away from it. And, um, I was horrified a couple of years ago when I heard that two of my four kids owned crypto. And um, <laughs> one of them was my daughter, who at the time was 13 years old and plugged in and started mining it. And so I gave her great credit for doing it. I, I didn't put her up to this. She just did on her own. And the other was my son, who at college trades crypto in his free time as, a, I think, really a form of gambling. And he, he bought Ether about six weeks ago. And he's doubled his money on this. But I can tell you that they don't know much about valuation models. And I would just repeat what Oswath said, you know, that there doesn't seem to be any way to think about how to value this because there's no cash flows connected to it. But one could make the same observation about gold. And we have another question. Is the key difference between 2016 and 2020 having the existence of future market? It's an interesting question. You know, the... um, the futures for Bitcoin, at least the, the first mainstream regulated ones, came out in December of 2017 in Chicago. And you now see them being traded all around the world. So it, it's interesting that it's not just the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, but there are futures in, in many markets. And arguably, they are leading to better price discovery. And I think it will be interesting to see how the futures markets behave on the day that the halving occurs. Um, I think definitely there's more market completeness. There's also a far greater portfolio of other digital assets that you might want to own compared to four years ago. Um, So I don't know the answer to your question, but I've had, you know, the same observation going around in my own mind that, um, this is a more mature and complete market and the presence of regulated futures markets really is, is a big reason for that. Okay, so I have a, another question. Um, so this is kind of related to the natural rate of interest. So the person would rather be anonymous, but he's saying the rec- his recollection or her recollection is that the natural rate of interest is a function of the expected growth rate of the economy. Do you think that the zero interest rate is a symptom of long-term stagnation in the economy? Or what other factors affect the natural rate of interest rate? I've never really thought that to be correct. You know, the, the interest rate is set by supply and demand and economic growth, but also demographic conditions play a big role in this. So you can have an economy that's growing, but the population growing even more quickly. And, you know, and this has been true of a lot of countries in the last 50 years. Um, the distribution of wealth also plays a big role. And to the extent that that distribution is highly concentrated, there's a relatively small segment of the population setting the rate. So, you know, this gets into monetary economics, but I don't, I don't take the negative interest rate to necessarily be a bad thing. I think first and foremost, it is a triumph of campaigns against population growth. They've been very successful. The fact that enormous countries like China and India have moved into largely middle-class economies has greatly changed the um, social dynamics and led to the growth of, of national savings as opposed to massive childbirth 
as retirement strategies, and, and there are many good externalities to this. And then we have a, the um, Tripti is, uh, I think it's more of a comment, it's saying that future markets could be more useful to miners due to the volatile nature of Bitcoin as they need to pay their costs in fiat currency. Yeah, I think um, it would be really interesting to get inside the financial strategy of miners. And we know very little about this. Many of them are first and foremost concerned with um, avoiding taxes, so they don't like to be particularly transparent. But I think in the long run, the cloud computing companies that are publicly traded will have a comparative advantage in this industry. And you have a really interesting hedging problem because you're a, a miner today, their variable cost is probably in China for energy and skilled labor. Their capital cost is in US dollars because all the mining equipment is priced in dollars and their revenue is in Bitcoin. And you have to you know, worry about risk management and characteristically Bitcoin has had zero correlation with any fiat currencies. And so you can't easily hedge it with, um, with fiat or anything else. And so yeah, futures may play an interesting role. It certainly makes sense, but it would also expose them to the kind of regulatory scrutiny that they may not welcome under many states of the world. Well, the next question comes from uh, Rina Agarwal, who's asking uh, kind of a more broad question. What do you think is going to be the future of ICOs? It's an interesting question. I have a paper that many of you have probably seen with mm -hmm. Marina Niesner, Sabrina Howell, that we um, argue that this is an innovation of cap in capital structure that is probably here to stay. And we have a lot of evidence that the companies that successfully pulled off ICOs were able to use the money to increase headcount. And um, I think there is definitely a role for this in entrepreneurial finance as a way for raising money for cus from customers and binding them to the platform and creating an internal market for these services. And if you've read our paper, you know that we've had um, a lot of cooperation from one of the more successful ICOs, which is Filecoin. And Filecoin has held its value very, very nicely. You know, even today, and we're two and a half years since their ICO, it's trading for multiples of value above what they raised, which itself was impressive at the time. So I think there's an, a role for this in entrepreneurial finance, but I think it's also true that the market was flooded by scams. Most of the scams have been chased out. And the real issue in ICOs at the moment remains the regulatory attitude, especially of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, there are very active cases. In fact, if you just read back over the past week, there's been a lot of motion practice in the federal courts surrounding some of the higher profile issues. And the key question is whether ICOs are securities under the Securities Acts of 33 and 34, and if they are, a whole host of regulatory costs and delays kick in that make them much less attractive. I think what really needs to happen with ICOs is that Congress needs to figure out how to deal with them, that there needs to be a statute that recognizes them as a new type of capital raising and figures out what's the optimal regulation. I don't think in many cases they are securities at all, but I can see why the agency wishes that they were because they, they do threaten the mandate of the agency itself. And so they've cherry picked some of the more outrageous cases and gone after them. But I think it, it's been pretty sketchy and there's definitely people in government with different views, including one of the five SEC commissioners. Um, we have a question from Samuel Selchuk who was asking, how will the Fed conduct reasonable monetary policy we're working with a zero negative interest rate. The zero lower bound is a worry, isn't it? So well, kind of a, even broader. <laughs> yeah, this is, first of all, the whole reason that you wanna make the money electronic and have a system of digital wallets because you, know, you put physical money under the mattress. And so I really believe within 10 years, every central bank will retire physical currency for exactly the reason implicit in the question that they the only way to conduct monetary policy, and just go back to my slide, is you, you really have to be able to push through the, um, the zero lower bound. Um, there's a good speech on this by Andy Haldane, the chief economist of the Bank of England, who gave a talk called, How Low Can You Go? And I think the essential insight is that there's nothing magic about the number zero, that the interest rate is the equilibrium price of capital. And 
minus one is just one less than zero in the same way that seven is one less than eight. And there's no reason the market equilibrium couldn't be minus two, minus three percent. I think there's a mental block, but people will get over it, especially you know, maybe a much faster speed once we see what happens over the course of the next year or two, where I think interest rates are going to be under enormous pressure to go down. But this is essentially a technological problem, and this is exactly how it's addressed, is you know, essentially by, by digitizing everything with robust technology that we now have. And we have another question. Uh, do you think, or will blockchain technology, blockchain tech mitigate the leverage cycles? Leverage cycles, is that? Yeah, yeah. In a word, no. <laughs> Blockchain, <laughs> it enables much better record keeping and much more data security. And it has applications far beyond finance and things like logistics and food safety, um, registration of fine art. You know, it's, it's a long, long list. But there's no particular incentive to avoid leverage. In fact, you might argue that with better record keeping, um, you might see even more fine slicing and dicing and contingent transfer of you know, using smart contracts that, that it may even make things more levered, but this is something for the future. And I think, yeah, we have a kind of, this is kind of a question from also Jim Angel, which I think I'm gonna make a little bit broader. Um, so right now, some people are concerned about uh, the um, carbon emissions or like, you know, like the energy consumption uh, yeah. associated with Bitcoin and people are be talking about proof of work, proof of stake as different kind of ways to uh, handle it. What is your view on that? I think it's a very interesting problem. And um, my recent doctoral student, Fahad Saleh, has a dissertation on this, which is almost accepted at the RFS. And so I would begin by referring you to Fahad's excellent paper on proof of stake. But there's no question proof of work is extremely energy intensive. And if you could find a fixed investment in something other than energy and take the environmental costs off the table, that would be you know, to the world's benefit. Now, having said that, I think a lot of this is greatly exaggerated because people build mines where the marginal cost of energy is zero. You know, it's their main variable cost. And so you tend to see a huge amount of hydropower, wind power, often in very remote areas like Northern Quebec, where nobody else would be using the energy. Um, there are mines opening in Texas using solar and wind power. But, you know, the amount of renewables going on to the um, energy grid in the Bitcoin blockchain is far greater than people realize. And if it were really over-consuming energy, you would see the price of energy rise and then, you know, the market would discourage it. And th these are problems of resource allocation very well solved by free markets. And I don't think um, a lot of the critique that you hear surrounding this issue is terribly well informed. So I have a Jim Angel who raised his hand. Let me unmute him. And Jim, you can go ahead. And I think this is the last question, given that we are already at 1 p.m. Okay, well, well, I just wanted to uh, uh, debate that last point, because even though they're using so-called renewable energy, they're still displacing <clears throat> energy that could have been used for other things, such as smelting aluminum. So I think we do need to uh, pay attention to the environmental impact. And whether we go to proof of stake or uh, permission systems, um, I'm a big fan of crypto technology, but as we go towards a Fed coin, I think we need to adopt a more environmentally preferable uh, uh, solution. Yeah, you may know I had a debate of sorts with Adair Morse at the AFA just over a year ago, and you can play back the video. My views are a little bit different, and I think you know there really is a pretty intense use of renewables in this market, and areas near the tundra where you really would never be able to transport the power back to civilization. And again, free markets are really very appropriate. If, if you think there's a problem here, you simply put in an energy tax and um, you know, discourage the use that way or, or force people to become more efficient. And one of the um, aspects of, you know, I said mining hardware is improving all the time. The energy consumption is a big part of it. It's gotten more and more efficient. They're finding ways to recapture and, and recycle the energy generated simply by the heating of the machines. Um, miners have every incentive in the world. You know, they're very well aligned with the environmental goal because energy is expensive. And to the extent that they um, can get more efficient, it solves the environmental problem at the same time.
And I think you'll only see more of that. Yeah, one of my alumni is a miner, and <clears throat> he just bought a 50 megawatt coal-fired power plant in Kazakhstan. And were there other Kazakhs who aren't going to be able to turn on their ovens now because of his mine? Or? Well, they get to breathe the emissions. Well, again, this is a regulatory problem that is very easy to solve. And, and you know, if the Kazakhs don't want to burn coal, they shouldn't. But I don't think this person is forcing them to. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we can uh, kind of close it with uh, this uh, comment. Let me thank David for the great presentation. We're going to have uh, the slides of the presentation on the CFMP uh, website uh, this afternoon. And uh, let me thank everybody for connecting and asking amazing questions. And uh, we can reconnect next week. We, the next speaker is going to be Amit Seru next Friday. Thank you so much, everybody. Okay. Thank you all. And thank you. Thank you, David.